So welcome everybody, welcome to uh, the official launch of this uh, marvellous book, Planning in a Failing State, uh, Reforming Spatial Governance in England, edited by Olivier Sykes and John Sturzaker. Um, this is an important book and it's coming at a politically uh, important time for this country. So as Dean of the School of Environmental Sciences, I'm very much in the minority and I'm not a planner, but I'm very proud that uh, planning sits within the School of Environmental Sciences at the University of Liverpool. Of course, planning at the University of Liverpool was the world's first such department as we're uh, very proud of. And it was previously, of course, under the auspices of civic design. Hence the, the tagline here, the original planning school at the original Redwood University. But um, the reason I'm very proud that planners sit within our school, and they could, you know, in many other institutions, they, they, they wouldn't sit within the School of Environmental Sciences. They might be in social sciences um, or, or, or other, other combinations of, of academic partners. But planners are central to many of the, the sort of national and global challenges that relate to environmental issues and environmental change. Protecting towns and cities from the impacts of, for example, coastal erosion, uh, making urban and rural areas safe uh, from flooding, enabling low carbon living as we aim to achieve ambitious net zero targets, making transport more efficient, and greener, protecting our built and our natural heritage in the face of development and indeed in the face of uh, pressures from climate change. So you can see in the ways in which planning is relevant to all of those which are very much core to the, the subject of environmental sciences more generally. It's also an important bridge to other areas, some which sit within our school and others outside. Research and teaching in urban and rural economic development issues looking at politi political change, social inequalities, healthy living, housing, population dynamics, so some of these things that we, we do within the school and others are done in, in other parts of the university. So you can see how planning is, is very much central to, to our school and, uh, and to the university. I have to confess, I haven't read the book yet, guys, sorry. But um, I'm sure that many of these themes that are relevant to us as a school are relevant to what is contained within the book. As I said before, it is an important book, and so it's only fitting that we have a suitably auspicious lineup of speakers to come and support the book and to discuss some of the themes contained within it. So we're very pleased to, to have our speakers. I'll just, there they are. Um, and so we're going to hear from all of these people. So first of all, I'd like to introduce our principal guest today. Lindsay Richards is president of the Royal Town Planning Institute, the leading membership organization and chartered institute responsible for maintaining professional standards and accrediting world-class planning courses nationally and internationally. Lindsay has had a long and very distinguished career in town and country planning. After graduating from the University of Sheffield in urban studies and a postgraduate degree in town and regional planning in the 1980s, Lindsay took up various posts before moving to Milton Keynes to become the development control manager, delivering, amongst other things, permission for 11,000 new homes in 2009, uh, Lindsay moved to the Homes and Communities Agencies Agency in Birmingham, rising to become the head of planning, enabling, and development. From 2018, Lindsay was the head of planning at Homes England, which is the non-departmental non public body that funds new affordable housing in England. She was also head of the planning profession. Since 2020, she's been a trustee of Design Midlands, an independent, impartial uh, resource that's effectively providing support for local authorities, communities, decision makers, house builders, businesses, and design professionals. 
Lindsay stepped back from her, her, her role at Homes England last year to become vice president of the RTPI and became president last month. Her presidential focus for the year is to raise the profile of planning as a career choice, making connections with many of the current issues we face nationally, globally, and the, contrib and the contribution to those challenges that planners make. Lindsay is also seeking to raise awareness of the many ways into planning and the value of different disciplines. She wants to link this to the RTPI's current campaign, which is entitled It Takes Planners And, which is about tackling anti-planning and misinformation. And some of these issues are very pertinent to those which chime with the themes explored in, in the book, Planning in a Failing State. So we're delighted, Lindsay, to have you today and welcome you to say a few words about the book. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to try and use this for, um, rather than the mic. So um, thank you for the invite today. And um, I've had a great day. I've had a great afternoon. I've met some of the students who I can see at the top there, which was from the Spatial Planning in Action module. Um, fascinating to see the work that they've undertaken and to have a conversation about, hopefully, about career choice in the future. My aim this year um, is to actually visit all the universities where there are planning schools. This is the first um, visit, it would be. I'm from the Northwest, um, and what a great place to start. Um, so, of course, I'm here to, to have seen the university, to have um, experienced some of the students, but obviously the book launch. So thank you, Olivia, for um, inviting me and um, actually hosting me this afternoon. I have to say, I have read Planning in a Failed State, and I read it last week, and I read it when I was on holiday. And it sounds a bit planning nerdy, but I couldn't actually put it down, because much of it is actually what I've lived through for the last 20 or so years, you know, when we start talking about design codes and about zoning. And, um, and it's, quite, it's quite, I was going to say overwhelming to think that the, cha the, the amount of change that we've experienced as planning, uh, planners and professional planners that we've actually gone through and we look towards implementing. Anyway, we're going to hear um, from obviously the contributors about, about um, those 20 years. Um, and I don't want to sort of take their thunder away, but there are significant issues which are covered, which is around the loss of strategic planning, um, and then more recently around the planning reforms that we've all experienced. And it also takes us through, um, Doug was talking about misinformation and about um, an anti-planning movement. And, um, and in fact, you know, we, we talk about, we see headlines and we see planners being described as enemies of the state, um, which are the fact we're damaging, we cause delays, and that the planning profession and the planning process is very outdated. And these are actually great for headlines, great for social media, but very damning for us as professionals and as for um, those of the young cohorts coming through the planning profession. So there's much to do about actually grabbing the misinformation and grabbing the narrative, as we say, and actually dispelling much of the myths that we see. And I think the issue with the misinformation is that it leads to aggression in our profession. And so we've seen the campaigns which the RTPI have launched, where in my day, we were talking about this earlier, in my day, um, you know, some contrary... Um, comments would be on a newspaper and the next day it would be disposed of. Now it's on social media and it can be prolonged and it can be prolonged and it's actually quite hurtful and it's actually quite wrong. But what we need to do is we need to be thinking about how we can address the um, misinformation. So planning in a, in a failing state it covers key changes that, we've ex that we, I, have experienced um, over the last 20 years, and it's been quite a roller coaster. So we talk about and we hear about localism, loss of strategic planning, introduction of neighbourhood planning, 
Housing numbers and delivery, very much about my background from Homes England. Design, the introduction of Office for Place, the loss of CABE. Um, and also tools around raising the quality, such as design codes. It's actually fascinating how much there's been change and dynamic and a fast pace of those changes. So, and we've also, we read in the book, and I've read in the book around um, permitted development and around how that raises the quality. There's a question around the raising of the quality and the quality of placemaking that actually um, permitted development is creating. And I mentioned zoning. And, um, and we hear about and we've read about examples from other European cities. And then finally, we read around environmental issues, greening, the current context and actually the priorities around green. So as I said, it feels like a roller coaster. And many of us have actually worked through this. And I know some of our um, planning professionals are actually struggling with this in terms of keeping pace and understanding and helping to implement. These are the main changes in this book, which are actually underpinning the current reforms that we're all, we're all experiencing, and those that we will experience, I would say, this year, with coming up to a general election. So brace yourselves. It's potentially likely going to be rocky until planning is, I say, properly resourced. And we see in the book, and, I'll, and I quote from the book, just to show that I have read it, that pl planning is seen as the cause of and the solution to an enormous range of society's problems, and these include problems such as poverty and obesity. So we are the cause of the problems, and we're also the solution. And we're also told that what is underpinning reforms and policy changes is to make planning faster, more inclusive, less bureaucratic, more certain, greener, but above all, to deliver more housing. Again, that's lifted from the book. That's quite a challenge for our young planners, professionals coming through. So currently, we see the remit of planning widening. We talk about water neutrality, and we talk about BNG, I'll say, as more recent issues. But this is in a context where we've seen reduced funding and reduced investment in planning, and I would say especially in our local planning authorities. Again, we see figures about the reduction of investment, reduction of local authority budgets, reduced between 2009 and 10 to 2017-18, a reduction of 42%. And if you add on to that the loss of planning fees which has come through from um, permitted development, then actually you can see that local authority is struggling financially. And the problem with lack of investment is that I've experienced and I've understood and I've talked to some of the young planners that salaries, and I don't want you to put, put you off this, salaries are not keeping pace with maybe other professions and other departments within local authorities. So we see currently the context, the loss of senior managers, um, we see people moving out from the, private, the public sector to the private sector, and we also see planning professionals moving out of the profession. This is um, unprecedented levels of local planning authorities. And that can only lead to increased pressure on those individuals. And that means less engagement with the public and maybe with other departments within local authorities, leading to frustration, delays, increased pressure, increased vacancies. We, he we heard from the RTPI that there are a number of um, surveys undertaken, so one of them is and um, the state of the planning profession, where we heard directly from professionals working in the, in the sector and their understanding and their concerns and the challenges they face. And then also, we see about two years ago, the public perception survey. And this was a survey undertaken with members of the public. And actually, their perception of planning is quite different to what it is in reality. In fact, the understanding is actually quite limited. And that, for me, leads to a lot of misinformation out there and a lack of understanding of what we, as planners, do. So, this all leads to a lot of negativity. And I don't want to be, I've just spent the last five minutes, all doom and gloom about the planning profession. But actually, this is a very creative, collaborative, and a very worthwhile career to be in. And those of us who work in it have had a lot of 
feedback and a lot of positivity through those careers. And there are many opportunities that open up for planners in terms of the range of careers available. My theme is to build that cohort of young planning professionals. And I want to make the connection between subjects at school and subjects at undergraduate, which will then take planning planners or take students through to early choice of planning career. I want to build the cohort of planning professionals. We need more planners and we need a diverse range of planners which reflects our diverse communities. So it's a worthwhile career. It's been great to me. I've had um, great experience. I've met some fantastic planners and worked with the fantastic teams. And actually what we need to understand is how planning impacts our lives and the contribution it makes to our communities and building those communities in places where people want to live and work. So I said in my inauguration speech we need to be planning influencers. We need to be grabbing the narrative and we need to be using the campaign which is it takes planners and and having those conversations with people outside our profession. We can all be, I say, planning influencers. So my theme for the year is planning our future. So I want to make sure that we promote planning in a positive way and that it's a good career choice and that people should be making that choice early on in their education. So for me, it's absolutely fantastic to have been here, the first planning school um, at Liverpool in the northwest is where I belong. And it's great to actually have the opportunity to meet some students today to see some real hands-on education. So thank you, Ollie, for inviting me. Thank you for showing me around this afternoon. And thank you for a book that actually resonates quite with me for the sort of my, my history. So thank you. Thanks very much, Lindsay. So we'll move on now, and we're going to hear now from uh, the editors of, of the book, uh, Olivier Sykes, who's obviously uh, here at University of Liverpool, uh, and also, of course, Professor John Sturzaker, uh, old friend of ours at the University of Hertfordshire and the Ebenezer Howard Chair of Planning. Um, they, of course, are the editors of the book. Um, probably worth pointing out all the various contributors, many of who have sat in the audience. I see many contributors to the book. I, sh I shan't run through the whole name, list of names, because there's about a dozen of you. Um, but it's great that you're all here as well. So I'll hand over now to the double act, I believe. We're going to have um, Olivier and John Stadler. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks very much, Doug, for that, that uh, introduction. Um, before we talk about the book, um, we'd like to talk uh, for a moment about Will Brady, who those of you who've seen the book will know that the book is dedicated to. Uh, will was a great friend and collaborator of many of the authors that uh, Doug just referred to. Uh, D um, will was a frequent visitor to Liverpool, uh, often with his colleagues from University College Cork, uh, Brendan Sullivan, who's here today, as is Will's brother Mark. And Will, as well as being an inspirational planning educator and researcher, was also, as I've said, a great friend. He also had a massive affection for Liverpool outside his professional capacity, uh, being the fan of a certain football team here. We'll uh, leave it at that, just to keep everyone together on that issue. But uh, the red side of the city, shall we say, was Will's predilection. Um, we had many fantastic times with Will, um, as colleagues at Liverpool. Um, one occasion that sticks in the memory was at a conference in London in 2017 hosted by the French Embassy, no less, at which we watched the results of the 2017 general election coming in uh, with Will in the, in, in, in the pub, and that was quite memorable. Will also came to Liverpool in 2018 when he uh, gave a presentation at a conference that, that John organised around city regional planning in Ireland, and particularly his interest uh, in the case of Cork, obviously, and the sort of the county and the city regional planning. I think Will, as well, was a great communicator on planning to a wider audience, picking up themes that Lindsay has just uh, evoked. 
Uh, Will didn't just write for academic papers, he, he also wrote uh, in the, what you'd call mainstream press, I guess, he wrote opinion pieces. Uh, a recent piece he did was during the pandemic, actually, just at the time we were uh, putting the book together in, in 2020, he was reflecting on what the pandemic might mean for the future of city centres and how we plan them. Um, sadly, Will was taken from us in 2022, and the book is basically dedicated to Will Brady, who knew that planning doesn't have to fail, and that when it doesn't, it can make all our lives better. So, for Will Brady, thank you. Thank you. So, planning in a failing state. Why, why the book, I suppose, in a sense? Why do we choose to, to write the book? And then I suppose it's the, some of the themes we've already heard alluded to tonight. It's the narrative of planning failure, which has been constructed over a period of many decades. Those of you old enough to remember will remember Michael Heseltine, uh, you know, often a great friend of planning and uh, of Liverpool, famously quoting, uh, saying in 1980, I think, at the RTPI summer school, that there were thousands of jobs locked up every single night in the filing trays of uh, planning offices, you know, because planners were these tight regulators that were preventing things happening. Um, it's not a part of the political issue particularly. All parties have, have re-examined planning quite often. Uh, even uh, the other main party in the UK has appointed economists and others at periodic periods to, to unpick whether planning is actually a help or a hindrance to the flourishing of our society. Um, and if you look at the quote on the right from Peter Hall in his, his last academic paper published in Town Planning Review, the journal published out of Liverpool, he said how planning has become the villain, held responsible for an accelerating housing shortage, powerless to stop bad development. It appears to have lost the capacity to plan good urban places and is supine in the face of proposals for low-grade development backed by repeated appeals. Of course, that's a quote from the middle of the 2010s, and the 2010s was a period characterised by extensive, sometimes what felt like permanent uh, reform to the planning system, often without allowing one set of reforms to bed down before new reforms were introduced. And so that was very much the context from which the book came out, or what historians call a conjuncture, a set of period uh, in history when different things come together. There are some dates arranged there, 2016, we don't need to talk about that one. 2020, of course, the planning white paper was published, and that was in a sense a spur for the creation or the project of the book, essentially. It was in the middle, or at least sort of after the first or second lockdown, and we were thinking how can the team of researchers at Liverpool and, and some colleagues from elsewhere respond to the planning white paper. Well, what can we bring in terms of our expertise to reflect on this particular statement about the future of planning? Some of which uh, of the ideas in there being quite um, radical. And again, a white paper which begins with the florid rhetoric of one Boris Johnson with a very strong argument about planning's failure. Um, uh, that, you know, it's a failed project, a relic of the 20th century. It needs to be knocked down and started again with from the basic sort of ground level. So the premise of the project and the book was to ask, you know, essentially who's failing and, and whose failure are some of these dissatisfactions that we see with planning? And perhaps to ask the question that might the state that planning is in be the result of failures by the state, the UK government perhaps, rather than planners and, plan and the planning system. And so the book keys into an idea that's been used by quite a lot of different commentators, which is the interplay between the state we're in, famously Will Hutton, and the state, and the political state. It's a sort of concept that's been used by different people, including John Snow, who, as you probably know, didn't complete his degree at this university because he was rusticated, which means kicked out uh, for staging a protest in the old Senate House building. But he's written a book recently called The State of Us. Satirists have used this. Britain, What a State was a book which came out a few years ago. And more recently, uh, the geographer Danny Dawling has published a book uh, called Shattered Nation, The Inequality and the Geography of a Failing State. So we see the book as perhaps keying into some of this debate from a, a particularly planning perspective, particularly from the perspective of the planning profession as well. So planning in a failing state is asking that question about you know, perhaps putting the boots on the other foot for once and asking whether it's actually the state which is responsible for the state of planning rather than planning, which is the villain which should always be chastised for unsatisfactory outcomes. That's what the book was about. This is what we found out, and John is going to present that.
Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Ali. So I've got the hospital pass of trying to summarise this sort of 200 odd page book in, in five minutes. So I'm going to try and do that. Um, so several of the points I'm going to cover have, have already been alluded to by people. So Doug mentioned the, the excellent set of, uh, of colleagues and contributors we've got. That's the contents page on the left hand side there. So essentially 10 self-contained analyses of different aspects of planning, different scales of planning, different themes all of which do, I think, a really uh, sort of magisterial job of, of unpicking some of the, the, the things that have happened, essentially, in relation to planning over the, as, as Ollie called it, the long 2010s. Um, so excellent set of, of uh, colleagues contributed to those. And then Ollie and I had to sit down and say, OK, how do you try and pull that together in, in a conclusion? And we said, OK, well, it looks like there were you know, these four R's that are summarized on the slide there. So just to sort of expand on those a little bit. The first is rhetoric, and we've heard already some of the examples of that, back to from Michael Heseltine, um, Lindsay referring to people talking about planners as enemies of the state. And just last week, there was another consultation on a new bit of planning reform that said that what they need to do is overcome tiresome bureaucracy. So again, constant kind of language used which doesn't make, it isn't great if you're a planner to see this stuff in the press, uh, isn't great for people studying planning or wanting to think about studying planning, so it's, it's all a bit depressing and kind of undermines, um, as Lindsay said, us as professionals trying to do, you know, trying to do our best. So that's one of the, one of the sets of, uh, of sort of context and one of the things that we, that we found. Uh, the second is rapidity, and again, this has been covered already, constant reform, um, never-ending series of changes to the planning system, accompanied by a never-ending series of changes to the politicians in charge of planning. When we were writing the conclusion, we found there'd been five ministers in charge of planning within the last year alone, and something like 10 or 15 within the last 10 years or so, a kind of almost ludicrous merry-go-round of, of changes at the national level, and unsurprisingly, changes in views about what's important and what, what we should be trying to do. So that makes it very difficult for planners to try and set their stall out and change and implement the, the change that planners can do so well when the ground is constantly shifting beneath them. Uh, the third R is resourcing and the very significant cuts to public spending on planning and related things. 86% cut in, um, in central grants from central government to local government. Similar cut in the budget of the, the department in charge of planning at the national level. So unsurprisingly, a massive hollowing out at national and local level of planning departments and a big loss of capacity. Again, making it ever harder to, to do positive things. Um, and so each of the chapters looks at those, those issues from a different sort of perspective. But the overall thing that we found coming out again and again from these different chapters is the final R, uh, regressive outcomes. Basically, the worst off in society being hit most repeatedly and most seriously and coming off worse from these, these changes. You know, the poor getting poorer, essentially. The poor being, you know, having the most significant cuts inflicted on them in terms of local authorities. Being less well equipped to do things like neighborhood planning that Lindsay mentioned. Being, um, you know, less well provided for by other aspects of planning that are being cut back. So. You know, as, um, as has been said, a pretty depressing, really, sort of catalogue of failures at the state level over the last 10, um, 13 years. Um, but, you know, as with Lindsay, it's a bit depressing to finish on that. And we try in the book to say, OK, it doesn't have to be like this. We know it doesn't have to be like this because it isn't like this in other places in the rest of Europe or much of the rest of Europe. They have planning systems that are properly funded, properly resourced, properly equipped and have some degree of stability in them. Uh, and where you have those things, you have a planning system that can deliver better places for people, for the environment, and for the economy. So there's a message there for possibly a new government, if we do have a general election this year, and there is, as the by-elections last week might suggest, a change in government. It isn't brain surgery to make things better. You just need some degree of consistency and, indeed, consistent support. So, fingers crossed, things might get better. Um, but, um, yeah, if you want to read more about all this, um, the book uh, is available uh, in certain bookshops and certainly from the Policy Press website. I should, I should just put a plug in uh, nakedly uh, at that point. Um, pardon? 
leaflets are 50% off, as Ollie pointed out, thank you very much, uh, available uh, downstairs. So thank you. That's it for me, I think. And um, Doug, are you, I'm not sure whether, yes, Doug's coming back up to you. Thank you. I have a quick opportunity to put the mic back as I walked off with it. You don't want to hear me. Thanks, Olivier. Thank you, uh, John. And now we'd like to ask uh, Professor Mark Baker to come and say a few words from the academic perspective on the book. Mark is a former alumnus at the University of Liverpool, uh, did his master's in civic design here before going on to a career in practice and then becoming professor at the University of Manchester. So thank you very much, Mark, for joining us today. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that uh, introduction um, and for inviting me to this book launch. Um, I was going to introduce myself because I wasn't quite sure whether um, there was a, a biography, but yes, um, I'm currently a professor at Manchester. Um, but before you hold that against me, I did, as uh, uh, Doug said, uh, graduate in an MCD back in the end of the 1980s, the mid-1980s, long time ago now. Um, and it's funny, at that time, uh, when I got my first job working for Durham County Council in structure planning, um, planning was under attack by government. It was kind of the time of that jobs in filing cabinets and Nick Ridley as Secretary of State and the need to reform everything. It's good to see things have changed, has not it, since? Um, and yeah, I then went off uh, working in uh, local government and actually for central government for a bit in the government offices when they existed uh, and eventually found myself back in uh, academia. And because of my background, I guess I've always been interested in the state of the UK planning system and doing research on, on the UK planning systems practice, particularly the strategic end and regional end. Um, and so it's great to see a book coming out that uh, focuses on that and captures that and what's been going on um, recently. Problem is the details, uh, the system changes all the time and you might be said it's sort of a foolhardy task to try and sort of take up a book that's sort of reflecting on what's going on now because by next week it'll be different again. Uh, and um, I think the introduction to the book and what um, Olivia and John has just said uh, reinforces that, that we've had the, the three prime ministers, the, 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 the six or uh, whatever it was, secretaries of state, since you started thinking about this book. And actually, when you were thinking about the book, it was to do with the white paper that came out at the time, which now has been abandoned anyway. Um, we've got levelling up and uh, possibly new, new changes. And, and a lack of continuity, unless uh, you count two of those secretaries of states being called Clark. Uh, and the fact that Michael Gove has popped up again for a second time. Um, so, um, you know, it's, it, it's, uh, it's interesting. And, and I always tell my students, of course, um, well, the, the, I teach them in a planning powers and procedures type course, that there is no textbook that you can look at for what's been going on recently because it's all kind of changing all the time. Uh, in some ways, in, for, for a brief period at least, this does that and I can say something different and I can try and get them to get the leaflet and get half price books uh, for, for this one. But, but of course, really, the, the value of this book is not that it's kind of, uh, you know, as up to date today, um, it's, it's that it gives the first reflections and critique, and I have to say, um, you know, with the, with the emphasis on critical, rightly, uh, of what's been going on over the last, um, what, 10, 12, 13 years since uh, the coalition and conservative governments. Um, and that's its value, I think, from an academic perspective. It's the first book that I've seen that's come out and done that. There may have been various articles in things like town and country planning picking up bits of what you've covered in the book. There may be um, you know, bits and pieces that others have written about, such as in Tim Marshall's book a couple of years ago on politics and planning and so on. Um, but this is the first book that kind of pulls it all together in a comprehensive way and kind of covers the whole, whole gamut of planning issues. And that's, uh, as I say, it's, it's, it's real um, value, I think, from a, an academic perspective. It's a bit like, I think, uh, you know, reflecting back on the, the labor reforms and the labor government in the, in the, in the first half of the 10 years of the 2000s. There was a book by um, someone like Phil Almendinger on new labor and planning and so on. And in a sense, this fills that gap for the new since 2010 um, situation. So, um, in that sense, um, I, I'm, you know, very pleased to see it coming out. Um, it's also got that clever title that uh, you mentioned in that, you know, captures failing state of planning, but more importantly, the fact that it's 
probably the cause of uh, central government failing uh, to deliver a planning system and actually the broader perception of perhaps a failing state more generally. I mean, it's, it's ironic that well, I think when the government came in, they, they kind of talked about broken Britain. And I don't think certainly in relation to the planning system, and we won't talk about anything else <laughs> this evening, but I'm not sure it's been mended since. Um, so, uh, yeah, that, that very much um, sort of resonates. Um, I liked the way that you did pull out those four R's um, at the end. That you, I won't go through all of those again, but that obviously is, is, is a, an interesting way of trying to bring it all together uh, at the end. We've certainly had a lot of rhetoric attacking planning, and somehow we need to get move away from that, and Lindsay <laughs> was very much uh, on, on that theme. Um, hopefully we can do that, though whether, whether it will be with this current government, uh, I'm not sure. Um, I wasn't sure whether the second R was rapidity or reforms, but it could be either, <laughs> and, and, and they still continue, as you say. You know, even last week in trying to teach, I was actually teaching permitted development rights last week to students, uh, and we've got you know, new consultations on extending them further, and we've got the, the possible new, new, new um, drafting of the MPPF to reflect on the brownfield land uh, sort of emphasis and so on and um, you know and, and if there is a change of government at the end of this year then I guess we can expect um, a whole host of new reforms to come through uh, in the future. But the book itself uh, is impressive because of its comprehensive coverage of topics uh, and processes. So we've got housing, we've got design, or should I perhaps say beauty these days, though maybe there's some hope that, that might kind of go away a bit um, in the future, environmental planning, infrastructure and so on, as well as covering both the, the, the kind of local level and neighborhood planning through to the, my interests of the strategic and regional planning, although that's completely kind of absent really at the moment. Um, and interestingly, that, uh, the, the, the chapter on um, zoning and um, making the point that although we kind of sort of all talk about how the, the UK system is very different to everybody else because we've got a discretionary system, actually those, those systems are often developer-led uh, and, you know, are also pr prone to being changed when a proposal comes along um, at, at that stage. So that was quite interesting in sort of exposing a few myths of the differences. Um, and particularly impressive, I think, is, uh, as already alluded to, I think, by, by Doug earlier, that almost all the contributors of this book come from Liverpool University. I think there's only um, uh, Richard and, and uh, Phil that were not from Liverpool, if I kind of uh, continue to regard John as an honorary member of uh, Liverpool University, even though you're, you're now a professor at Hertfordshire. Um, and, and so, in a way, that shows the breadth of interest in planning in this uh, department um, at, at Liverpool University and the breadth of expertise, because it was based, the book, on research that was being done by the contributors. Uh, and that's quite impressive um, in that, uh, particularly as I've always been interested in sort of what I might call mainstream planning practice. Uh, and as planning schools go off and sort of collect quite often people who are working in specific uh, niche areas, perhaps more of an international focus and all sorts. It's actually quite good to kind of see a department that can bring together such expertise covering sort of all issues um, that are relevant um, in one place. So uh, I commend you for that. Uh, that that's very good. And, and befits the world's oldest planning school and an RTPI accredited uh, programs and so on. So basically, I just wanted to say congratulations to Olivia and John for pulling this together and to all of the uh, contributors for making it happen. It's the first serious book, I think, that's come out that reflects on what's been going on, the turmoil of the last 12 years or, or, or whatever. Um, it's necessarily bleak, but I was pleased to see there was little sort of gamuts of hope in there, you know, the, uh, uh, the environmental stuff maybe is because of the general sort of more interest in uh, climate change and net zero and um, possibly biodiversity net gain and so on. There's some kind of things that are happening there, but maybe getting design onto the agenda is good, even that maybe if beauty is not necessarily the right way to go about it. Uh, and so on. I mean, uh, you know, even my strategic end, it's possible that the uh, combined authorities and so on might start to deliver something, though even Manchester is uh, struggling to do that and the others haven't even bothered to try, I think, so far. So um, we, we, we need to wait a bit. But, but there are some hopes there. And, and more importantly, at the, towards the end of the book, there is a little summary of sort of some principles of going forward that actually may be um, a, a newly reformed and reinvigorated, reinvigorated planning system might um, sort of embrace. We probably will need to wait for further change um, before that might happen. Um, but the 
hope is there and maybe um, in 10 years time or whatever we might be coming back here and talking about um, planning in a rejuvenated state and a book pulled together by uh, members of the department. Um, I certainly hope so. So congratulations on the book uh, and thanks for inviting me to come over and say a few words. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. And uh, finally, our uh, uh, auspicious uh, external speaker here who's come to present the kind of the practice view on the issues covered in the book. Uh, we're very delighted to have Jane uh, Healy Brown, who's the Director of Planning and Global Town Planning Skills Leader at Arup. So J Jane is uh, currently one of our visiting professors and makes a huge and very viable contribution to teaching. Some, some of the students will have, have interacted with Jane and is working on a research project uh, with us on sustainable de development goals and their influence on planning. So thank you, Jane, and welcome. Good evening, everybody, and thank you. And I have to say, I'm not sure I can say much that follows better than Mark's summary of necessarily bleak. Should you need a quote to go on the back of the book, I think that should be the one to go for. Um, can you hear me? Oh. I don't mind being Mark for a bit. <laughs> thank you. Um, so really delighted to give a bit of a practitioner perspective um, on this and uh, builds on the lovely relationship I've had with the department for a number of years now in terms of the lecturing and the research that Doug, you, you kindly mentioned. Um, and I'll give some reflections on things that really stood out to me um, in the book from my experiences within practice. And I genuinely enjoyed reading it. And there's not... Always, as a practitioner looking at an academic-based text, you feel that way, but it really resonated. Um, and there's lots of reasons in terms of some of the examples that I can draw upon with that. Um, I did enjoy the opening with the debate around um, different definitions of the term state um, and uh, playing around with that and the different applicability of state to planning. Um, look at the state of you could have been an alternative title. I think it was also perhaps a description of me walking windswept down the strand a couple of times over the course of today as well. Um, I enjoyed reading about the focus on the different national governments, the different tinkering that we've experienced with planning process over the last few years. And, and perhaps the head-scratching moments for a number of our politicians where this tinkering hasn't delivered the outcomes they expect, but without really understanding why and going back to try and understand that. And I hope this book actually might give some insights into that as we look into the future as well. I was really delighted to see some reflections around that interface and the disconnect, really, between particularly local politics and local planning. And this is something I've spoken about previously and feel quite passionately about. What the purposes of planning are in terms of long-term looking across all se sectors of community often feels as a disconnect between what local politics is trying to do, which is short-termism and answering the voice of the loudest in our communities. And I do feel as though that's a heart of what some of these challenges have been, is the fact that this disconnect exists at a local level but also central government that tries to address some of the challenges doesn't necessarily recognise or indeed want to recognise what those challenges mean. And I think some of that plays out when you're looking particularly at our Conservative-led government we have at the moment and you look at the house building developers, what they want, how that then plays out at a local level as you describe in terms of some of those donors wanting that house building but then when it comes at a local level and those communities object to that, the challenges that that arise. And you wonder actually how we can garner some of the disconnect that happens there to actually support some of the changes. But until we can start to address the disconnect between planning and politics at a local level, I fear we will continue with tinkering that continues not to deliver the outcomes that central government and probably us all as professionals would want to see as well. There are some lovely facts in the book. Um, I did really enjoy the fact that it's 20 years since we stopped calling it development control. One of those things that made me feel quite old and you mentioned development control, Lindsay, as well. That, yes, gosh, how time flies with such things. Um, 
Chapter 4 I found particularly resonated with me. I do a lot of work on regeneration. It talks about the Leveling Up programme, which I think has been a really force of positivity um, from central government. Um, not necessarily always looking at planners to deliver, but very often has engaged planners in its delivery. And it's a real opportunity to actually set out where planning is providing that vision and that future thinking that we really are wanting to, to put forward as a profession. And I was really fortunate to work as part of the Towns Fund, fund um, delivery partnership on behalf of DLOC delivering the Towns Fund programme and I was looking initially after the 45 towns that were in the north and then looking at some of the strategic governance issues across all 101 towns that were in that programme. Um, and I think it's really notable some of the things that you say in the book about where the levelling up programmes have gone. And I think one of the hidden things that came, has come out through that programme is again this looking at power balance between central and local government. And one of the hidden things that uh, came through that programme is the shift in power even more centrally um, from local government by the requirement for each town to have a town deal board and the requirement that each one of those boards included the local MP. And I'd say until that point, the role of an MP on some of these more localised programmes hadn't been such a requirement and hadn't been as strong and we are continuing to see that in the government's continuing levelling up programmes. Um, and we shall see where that takes us to in the future as well. The lack of stability from the merry-go-round of planning ministers has been mentioned already. Um, and I think <coughs> one of the things that though is a positivity, if I dare put it in these terms, is that you say at the writing of it in February 23, you fully expected that by the time it's published, uh, Michael Gove would no longer be minister because that's just the way it's been. But it wasn't. He's actually still here. So we do finally have some consistency of sorts. But what you didn't get the chance to know with that consistency is that he does have this amazing habit of delivering Christmas presents to planners with all his announcements always seeming to come in the week before Christmas. I don't know why, quite what might be behind that. And just going back to the point around centralisation of planning and the role of local and central government, um, there's a great discussion about the centralisation of power, and I think there's still unresolved issues. We still haven't worked out what we do to replace regional assemblies, regional development agencies, and I know some in the room will have a, a fondness for, for what they were able to deliver in the past. The, perhaps the best we've seen of that is through combined authorities. Um, and the delivery that they're giving and the devolution that that's allowing us to achieve, it's still very early days, particularly when you compare it to national level. There does still seem to be this sense of distrust from central to local government, but we are at least seeing some examples of good practice. And I think that follows through then also the lack of trust and support for strategic planning, which for me is really the opportunity more than any for the positive voice of planning. And as I come to conclusion on this, I think I do want to think about a positive. And we mentioned Greater Manchester, and I'm really proud to be the Planning and Housing Commissioner for the Greater Manchester Combined Authority. And I've spent over a decade supporting them in preparing their Places for Everyone strategic plan of nine of the ten local authorities. And just last week, we received the good news of the inspectorate's letter supporting that to go forward to the local authorities for adoption. We should take these positives. This is actually positive planning in action. This is giving direction for communities. Obviously, there are controversies, as there is with any planning document. But if we want to set these objectives of future and want to attract the investment, this is the way that we should achieve it. So in conclusion, as planners, we've spent the last few years trying to keep up with this ever-changing policies, procedures. We've talked about it. it's a roller coaster, a merry-go-round. My goodness, it's felt like that, which has meant none of us have really had a chance to step back and absorb it. And it's wonderful that this book has captured that for us so well to document that era. And I hope that that helps provide reflection for current planners, for future planners, and maybe even a few politicians to actually reflect on some lessons for the future. So I commend the whole team, I know many are here today, for a wonderful set of reflections, 
and I do hope that it actually helps bring the conversation forward to achieve some of the objectives I'm sure we all hold very dear. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jane, for your uh, uh, really quite inspiring words there. And um, I'm aware of uh, the incredible expertise in the room here, and it is tempting to go to a Q&A, but I think we're a little bit over time. So we'll perhaps save that for discussion downstairs where we've got some uh, uh, nibbles and refreshments uh, to have those, those conversations. But I'm, I'm very aware of, of, of how... Uh, of how much expertise there is. If I was proud of planning before I stood up this morning, I'm, I'm bristling with pride, having heard the testimonies from our external speakers, uh, and uh, both, both of you have done a fantastic job in editing it, but all our contributors as well. So many of my colleagues are here and have contributed to this. Fantastic. Um, and, and I think a, a very positive note on which we can end is, is it's great to see so many students uh, have joined us as well. Uh, you are the planners of the future. Um, and it's great that you're being exposed to such, um, you know, um, current and uh, involved and well thought through and considered debate, uh, critical thinking, and you're going to be tremendously well equipped when you go out and tackle some of these challenges that we've been discussing today. So I think that's a really positive issue as well. Um, I'd like to say thank you to all our uh, speakers. Uh, thank you especially to uh, Lindsay for coming and joining us in your role in, as the president of the RTPI and we're very honoured that you're our first uh, university uh, visit is, is to us. Um, I'd also want to thank um, um, Becca uh, Prescott and Jamie, where's Jamie, um, who have been uh, instrumental in putting an event together. Um, these sorts of events don't just happen. There's a lot of work goes on in the background, and, and the two of you in particular have done a, a huge amount uh, to organize this evening. Uh, thank you all for coming along this evening. Um, we really, really appreciate your support, uh, and it's a real, real privilege to have, have so many of you with such distinguished uh, contributions to planning uh, in the audience tonight. And I hope you're able to hang around and, and uh, mingle and, and chat and catch up downstairs. Thank you all very much. <laughs>